Okay, so um, our next speaker for the day uh, has just finished his PhD um, on security of, uh, yeah, I think that deserves a round of applause. Um, on the topic of security of a WPA, TLS, and RC4. Um, he's now doing his postdoc and uh, focusing on wireless security. So, um, and the next talk, uh, the title is Predicting and Abusing WPA2, 802.11 Group Keys. Please give a big round of applause to Mati Vanhoff. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction. So I am indeed uh, Mati van Oof, and I'm going to present Predicting on Abusing WPA2 Group Keys, or more officially, uh, 802.11 Group Keys. So first, a quick introduction to Wi-Fi security. What uh, was the state of Wi-Fi security before I did this research? Well, essentially, Wi-Fi security has been uh, thoroughly investigated. There have been uh, a lot of uh, results. Um, for example, we know with the very first security algorithm of Wi-Fi, wired encrypted uh, privacy, um, in other words, web, uh, it was uh, horribly flawed. Uh, you probably all noticed that you can uh, crack a web uh, network within mere uh, minutes. Uh, in fact, if you download the latest tool suite of uh, Airquack, NG, and there is enough traffic on the network, you can really uh, obtain the pre-shared key of the network within only uh, a few minutes and sometimes, if you're lucky, even seconds. So the first uh, attempt by the 802.11 group to introduce a security protocol, it didn't really went that well. Um, we also have other attacks recently against uh, wireless networks, and in particular against uh, WPA2. Uh, one example, uh, which is quite recent, is that uh, some vendors uh, or some ISPs, when they hand out their router, they initialize it with a default uh, password, with a default passphrase, and it turns out that these are rather predictable. Um, in particular, uh, this uh, default password, which would be shown somewhere here on the back of your router or on the card you receive with it, it was derived from the MAC address. So if you want to attack one of these networks, you simply have to sniff the network, determine the MAC address, and from that, you could derive uh, the shared key, uh, the pre-shared key of the network. Um, and similar to this, you also have uh, dictionary attacks against a WPA2 handshake. So these are all known attacks, and the way that this dictionary attack work, works is essentially uh, you can force a client to disconnect from the network, and then it will reconnect with the network. And if it reconnects, it of course performs a fresh hand handshake with the access point to negotiate uh, session keys. Now, the bad part about this handshake is that as an attacker, you can capture the four messages that are uh, exchanged in this handshake, and then you can perform offline guessing attacks at the password of uh, your network. And you know, if the handshake would have been better designed, these kind of dictionary attacks would not have been possible. Unfortunately, the way the handshake was designed, uh, you can uh, make a capture of the handshake, you can process this offline, and these kind of dictionary attacks uh, are unfortunately possible. Um, I think a few years ago there was also a attack uh, which shows that using a bit of social engineering as well, you can even attack WPA2 enterprise networks. Uh, and these are networks uh, where you have to type in your username and password. So think of Ethereum or your company network, uh, or also here the CCC network, you also have one of these enterprise uh, networks as well. And the idea behind this attack, I'm not going to go in detail here because these are known, uh, but one of the parts that they use is they broadcast a network with the same SSID name as the target network, but they include a small space bar behind the name. And uh, if you then look at the network name in your uh, operating system, you won't notice that the network is, for example, Ethereum and then a space bar after it. So it's essentially a completely new network, and if you connect to a completely new network, um, it's your oper operating system won't really complain, because uh, otherwise it would, sh it would say, okay, uh, previously you connected to Ethereum, now it suddenly uses a different certificate, this is bad, but because the space was after, S after the SSID, your operating system will think, oh, it's a new network, everything is fine. 
Um, but as I mentioned, I'm not going into detail, uh, just mentioning it as related work in a sense. Uh, lately, there have also been a few more theoretic attacks against WPA TKIP. Um, they are similar in spirit to the attacks on the web, except cracking WPA TKIP is much, much more difficult, even though there are also other weaknesses in WPA TKIP, so you should not use it. Um, but there are theoretical attacks that allow you to recover the session keys uh, as well, though they are very hard to execute in practice. So, why am I telling you all this? Well, if you look at all this uh, previous research about the security of wireless networks, we can see that a lot of this work is focused on the security of the pre-shared keys uh, or of the negotiated uh, session keys. Uh, so that has received a very large amount of attention from the research community and also from hackers. However, uh, the keys that are used to protect uh, broadcast traffic, so the group keys, uh, they are not uh, widely used. Um, so here is something strange with the slides. For some reason, one slide uh, is uh, missing. Um, but anyway, so these uh, group keys, they are used to encrypt uh, broadcast and uh, multicast uh, traffic, and that is in contrast uh, with session keys. So for example, if you see here, your access point, it has a group key, and it also has a session key for every client that is uh, connected uh, to the network. And uh, so what we noticed is that uh, the security of these negotiated session keys is properly studied, but the security of the group key is not studied. So what I did during my research is that uh, I investigated uh, how these group keys are managed during their full uh, lifetime. So what do I mean with the lifetime of a group key? Well, we have our access point here, and uh, when you start your access point, so when you start your router, the first thing that happens is that it generates a fresh and random uh, group key. And here we notice that the random number generator, so the RNG that is uh, used to generate this group key, uh, is uh, flawed. So the standard suggests a bad random number generator as a reference implementation, and we will see in practice uh, that certain vendors also implement a random number generator that is predictable, and this will allow us to predict the group key. So that's essentially the first stage of the lifetime of the group key, when it is generated. The second part is when uh, a client connects to the network. When it connects to the network, it performs uh, this four-way handshake. It negotiates the session keys. These are sometimes also called the pairwise keys. Um, and during this handshake, the group key is also transported to the client, because, of course, it needs to know the group key to be able to uh, decrypt uh, broadcast and multicast traffic. And what we found here is that uh, we can manip manipulate this handshake as a man in the middle attacker, and we can then use uh, we can then force usage of uh, RC4, meaning uh, the group key when it is being transmitted from the access point to the client is encrypted using RC4. And RC4 is an insecure cipher; you should not use it. And in this context, we will see that we also, currently it's a theoretical attack, but we do have an attack against the way RC4 is used in this situation. Um, now also, one of the more interesting parts is also, let's say that we now, as an attacker, have the group key, what can we do with the group key? Because, of course, if we know uh, that key, we can uh, decrypt broadcast on multicast frames, we can inject broadcast on multicast frames, but can we do even more? And here we're going to show that uh, using some clever tricks, uh, we can use the group key to inject unicast IP traffic. So not just broadcast traffic, but also unicast traffic. And we will even show how we can uh, decrypt nearly all internet traffic of uh, the network. And then at the last part of the presentation, I'm going to propose um, a new idea on how to better uh, generate random numbers if you have a Wi-Fi uh, device. But the main part of the presentation will be these first three steps, and in particular predicting the RNG and then uh, abusing it to decrypt traffic and inject traffic. So before I get to the main content of the presentation, I'm going to uh, give a little bit more background on uh, how these group keys are used. So, Let's say we are in the following situation. We have our access point here, which has the group key of the network, and which has uh, the two session keys of the two connected clients here. And 
let's assume that in this situation, client A wants to send a broadcast network over the complete network. Now, if client A would uh, send this uh, broadcast uh, frame itself, then there is a problem because uh, there are certain situations where clients are out, uh, out of reach of each other. So that's the hidden terminal problem. If client A would broadcast the message, uh, client B would not receive it. So this was, of course, anticipated by the designers of the Wi-Fi protocol. So instead, what happens if, if this client wants to send a broadcast frame, it first sends it to the access point. And, uh, it will essentially uh, send this frame with as the immediate receiver, the access point. However, the final destination is the broadcast MAC address. And uh, because the immediate receiver is the access point, it will be encrypted using the session keys. Um, and when the access point receives this frame, it will also use the session keys to decrypt this frame, but then it will see, oh, okay, uh, the final destination is actually the broadcast MAC address, meaning I will have to forward this to all clients. Uh, and of course, all clients are in range of the access point, so in this case, uh, all stations will receive it. And when the access point sends the, uh, the broadcast frame, the immediate receiver on the final destinations are both uh, the broadcast MAC address, meaning in this case, the group key is used uh, to encrypt and send this frame. So the important takeaway message here is that only the access point normally will send real group frames because the client uh, will first forward it to the access point uh, as a unicast frame. So that's for the quick uh, introduction. Um, so as I mentioned, the talk will mainly be about uh, predicting the RNG and then decrypting all traffic. So let's start uh, with predicting the RNG. So the first question is, Okay, uh, does the Wi-Fi standard specify some method on how to best generate uh, these group keys? And it turns out that yes, uh, they do specify uh, a method. And in particular, they have a certain procedure for generating uh, the group key that will be used. Uh, and the crypto people call this uh, the key hierarchy uh, that is being used. So it's uh, actually fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, when your access point uh, starts up, it will generate a, a public counter value, so a random counter. It does not start at zero. It can start at uh, any value you want, uh, but it's public. So an attacker or outsiders are allowed uh, to know this variable. Uh, apart from that, it also generates a private uh, master key, uh, and this uh, has to stay secret, otherwise all your security guarantees uh, are gone. Um, so, once you have generated these two fields, uh, we simply take a hash of uh, both of them, and the output of that hash is the current group key. And uh, the current group key is also called the group temporal key, and the reason they call it temporal is because you can refresh it every hour or every day or every 10 minutes. Uh, and that's also the advantage of this construction, because if you want to generate a group key, it's very simple. You simply increase the public counter by one, you recalculate this hash value, and then you get the, a new group key. So this design uh, seems very nice, because if you want to generate a new group key, you simply increase this public counter by one, and you calculate a new hash. Uh, unfortunately, this design is actually quite bad. Uh, why is that? That is because these two values are only randomly sampled when your device boots, and new entropy is never introduced into uh, the system. So if for some reason uh, an attacker either compromises uh, this key and knows it, he can predict all future keys, or in our case, if the random number generator is bad, we can probably predict all future keys that are generated. Um, so this is a bad design uh, and should be avoided. Unfortunately, uh, it is officially specified this way in the standard. So in principle, um, well, the standard recommends everyone to use this key hierarchy, this procedure. So okay, now we know that if we can uh, predict these two values, uh, we can derive our group key. So the next question is, how are these random numbers generated? And Again, the Wi-Fi standard provides us with an answer because it suggests an example random number generator. And if you read the standard, it actually sounds quite promising because it says um, the RNG uh, that we use uh, should generate cryptographic quality randomness. And to show you the quote in detail, um, 
A station must be able to generate cryptographic quality random numbers, and you can look in the appendix at section M5 to see how you can achieve this. So this sounds very promising until you actually go to the appendix, and there it says, whoa, wait a minute, what we're going to show, show is just an example solution. Ideally, you should uh, extend it yourself. Um, and of course, uh, that's not really this is a strange situation because in the standard itself it says uh, this RNG in the appendix is secure, but if you actually read the appendix it says this is just an example solution, uh, it may not be that secure after all. So we have an inconsistency in the standard here. And just to come back uh, to uh, the text that is shown uh, in the appendix, it says that okay, you probably should combine it uh, with other recommendations on how to generate random numbers. This is expository only. Uh, again, you should uh, probably improve this, uh, which is very strange to see this kind of language in a standard. So we basically have an inconsistent, inconsistent description here. Uh, it says that uh, it should be secure, then it says it's not really secure. So the question is, how secure really is this random uh, number generator? And the next question is, how many platforms implement it? So let's look in detail at how the random number generator is implemented. Uh, and here we see uh, that uh, the standard uh, basically defines a function, which is the RNG, RNG. And first and for all, it's a stateless function. I'll come back in a minute why that it's a bad idea. Uh, but first and for all, it has a very vague description, even if they only meant this to be like an example solution to get people on the way. Because if you look at the code, there is a main uh, while loop here, a main loop, and it simply says, repeat this algorithm until it's random enough. Um, <laughs> They don't specify what this means, so that's very strange and suspicious. Um, a bit suspicious as well as also at the end of the algorithm, at the end of the loop. Um, so during certain parts of the loop, they say if the time is set to, as if the time is not available, you can simply set it to zero. Um, so this this line might not be be that bad if they include something like, if you set the time to zero, maybe you should include, should do more iterations of the main loop. But they simply say, oh, well, if it's not available, you know, just skip it. Um, so, like I mentioned, uh, the standard is a bit hard to interpret because they say it's a, an example solution, but on other parts they say it's, a qua it's supposed to be good. Um, but even if they only meant it as a, an example for the vendors, this description is still just too vague. Um, now, to come back to this uh, stateless part here, um, the random number generator is executed on demand, and only when this uh, function is being called is randomness collected. And again, this is a very strange de design, because if you have a proper RNG, for example, the one in OpenBSD, or the one in Linux, or the one in any decent design, basically, uh, their entropy is constantly collected in the background. For example, you have your uh, timing of interrupts, timing of packets, uh, you have clock skew, and so on. And normally, all this randomness is collected in a so-called entropy pool, uh, and then if you need randomness, you can extract a random number from this entropy pool, for example, using a hash or any other construct. But the fact that this function is executed on demand um, is also a very bad sign. So, all that is uh, not uh, that promising. And if we then look at the actual events where it extracts randomness from, we can see that it's mainly based on the timestamp of that frames are arrived and also on uh, clock uh, jitter. So let's look at these two uh, sources in detail. We have our frame arrival times. Um, so if your router would be connected to uh, an Ethernet cable and there would be a sufficient amount of traffic, then you could simply collect this based on Ethernet traffic. However, um, you don't always have the guarantee that there is sufficient traffic available. And um, the standardization committee, the people realized this, like there may not be uh, that many, much traffic available. So what they said is, um, you know, if there is not that much traffic, simply wait until a client uh, wants to connect and then send a few messages of the handshake 
then abort the handshake, restart the handshake, then abort the handshake, restart the handshake, until you captured enough uh, frames. Um, so this first and for all would be very time consuming. And the second bigger problem is if you are a client and you are constantly trying to connect with a network, but it fails a few times, then your device will simply blacklist the access point and this will not work. Um, so the fact that they even simply suggested using this is, in my opinion, absurd. Um, so the second source is the uh, clock jitter on Drift. Uh, so if you have a clock in an implementation, it is never completely accurate. There is also a small uh, amount that you can't predict as an attacker. Uh, the problem here is that they don't specify a minimum resolution that the clock should have. So a vendor can use any uh, clock at once, even one with a very low resolution, meaning only a very low amount of entropy uh, is collected. And of course, that's quite bad. So after I saw this, I thought to myself, Okay, this is just uh, basically uh, a big mistake of the standardization people. Surely everyone realized that this was bad and they implemented something big, something better. Um, but when I actually looked at code, um, so yeah, this is really like, what the hell are they doing? So if we look at uh, vendors, we have, for example, uh, MediaTek. It was used to be called also Rowling. And they implement uh, this random number generator uh, almost as, as specified with a few changes. And those changes uh, actually weaken it a bit more. Um, <laughs> they, they also did one good part, by the way. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, then there's also Broadcom. Um, the random number generator they use depends on the operating system uh, that is being used. Uh, and then there is also open firmware, uh, which is a good example of an embedded system. And there is host APD, which is the open source implementation of Linux. Uh, and you can see they do it properly. Um, so we did a very rough estimate of how many uh, networks are run using this MediaTek or Broadcom implementation. Um, so this was just using a very quick uh, war drive uh, around my city. Uh, and I determined uh, whether devices using MediaTek or Broadcom based on the fingerprint of the beacon. Uh, how that works is explained in a different paper. But essentially, I did a very, very rough estimate and I I, at most, let's say 25% uh, of networks could be vulnerable to this. Uh, I would say maybe 5 or 10% could be attacked using uh, attacks similar to the one we're going to present. Uh, just to show that uh, these are a bit popular and you might be able to use this uh, in practice. Uh, but anyway, let's look at the first implementation, the one of uh, MediaTek. So, what did they do? Well, first and for all, they implemented uh, the key hierarchy, uh, so the procedure on how to generate these group keys as proposed by the standard. Um, so just to recap, this is this construction where you generate two val variables, uh, one which is secret, the other which can be public, and then a hash is taken and the output is shown. They do uh, improve this uh, slightly, actually. So they do one thing that is good, namely, instead of uh, when they want to generate a new group key, instead of simply increasing the counter by one, they actually constantly generate a completely new random value for the counter. And that's, that's actually a very good decision, because then you are introducing new entropy every time you generate a group key. Uh, however, this uh, group master key, that one is only sampled at boot time. Um, okay. So we now know how their construction uh, works. Now the question is, uh, how do they implement this random number generator and can we then try to attack it? Well, this is the bad part of their design. They only use uh, clock jitter to uh, extract randomness and to collect entropy. In particular, it uses the so-called Jiffy counter of the Linux kernel. So the Jiffy's counter is uh, something that is increased every tick, but not every processor tick, uh, but every logical tick. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So this RNG is likely quite bad. And this is good for us, because uh, at least for us as attackers, 
because we simply have to protect uh, the group master key on this public counter, which is also count the G nonce, uh, the group nonce. Uh, and if we can predict both of them, we can derive uh, the group key. So let's try to attack uh, this RNG. As I mentioned, it uses this uh, jiffies uh, as the uh, counter. The problem is these jiffies have at best millisecond accuracy, which is uh, rather low. Um, in fact, it's really low. Um, so this means in practice uh, that the GMK, so this secret key, which is generated at boot, um, generally it always uses the same uh, Jiffy's values, so the claim same clock values. So that means in practice, uh, for the GMK, there are, say, around 200 to 300 possible values. At least if you have a... I tested this on my device, and for a specific device on specific firmware version, um, then you have a limited set of possibilities. Of course, if you run a different firmware version, um, then uh, some other things might happen during the boot process, uh, influencing the time when these GIF GIFIS values uh, are collected. But if you know the implementation you are attack attacking, you have a very limited set of uh, values. Then the second part is we have to predict this genons value. Um, on most the routers, it is, uh, the group key is regenerated every hour, meaning this genons value is also sampled every hour. So in order to predict this value, we need to know the uptime of the router to predict the range of possible Jiffy's values that were used. Um, and how do, we do, how do we determine the uptime of the router? Well, it's quite simple. The uptime is uh, leaked in the beacons of most routers. Uh, so we simply have to uh, sniff beacons, then we can estimate the uptime of the router, and then we can estimate the time of when uh, this genons was generated. Um, so basically, what do we have to do for a, a successful attack? We need to capture one encrypted uh, broadcast or multicast message. Um, we have to capture also a few beacons to estimate the uptime, and then we can uh, do a search through, whole, uh, through the whole key space. And, uh, we tried this uh, against our own router, so that's uh, this one. Um, and here we noticed, uh, well, we implemented uh, a program on the GPU, in particular on OpenCL, to make sure we can uh, do this in a timely manner. And we found that uh, using the GPU in my laptop, which is just a standard GPU, uh, you can even get better GPUs or even multiple ones. But even just on my normal laptop, um, I can crack the keys within three to four minutes. And this... <laughs> Thank you. So this is assuming the router also has an uptime of one year. And if the uptime is around one year, then there is also a lot of clock skew, meaning predicting the genons is harder. So if I'm going to demo the attack uh, in a few uh, minutes, then I know that the uptime was uh, very low, meaning I can reduce this number even further uh, because there hasn't been that much clock skew, meaning predicting it will be easier. So this, is, in a sense, is also uh, a worst case estimate. Uh, however, I do have to note that this is only if you are attacking one specific device, if you know uh, which device you are attacking. Let's say you don't know the exact firmware that is running, then you have to uh, perform a bigger search. Um, so the end result here is that you get both uh, the master key and the current group key. So I planned a demo here. Now, Wi-Fi demos are always very risky, uh, especially in a situation like this. Uh, so, fingers crossed. So, let me first try to mirror the screen. Let's hope we don't already fail here. Okay. So, um, here I have a Wi-Fi device that is running in monitor mode. Um, and I have a script that will uh, capture uh, the frames uh, sent by my router. So I, I already put it in monitor mode, so that is simply uh, this script. Just execute some commands to uh, put it in monitor mode. And I'm now going to capture packets that are sent by my router. Um, and I made a Python script for that. So let's execute that and capture packets from my router. 
As you can see, it's now trying to capture packets, uh, but nothing is received yet. And that is normal because the router is not yet started. So let's put it on. This was planned, by the way, to show you it's real. Um, so now the router is uh, booting, and in a few seconds, it should be receiving uh, beacons uh, from which it can uh, derive the uptime uh, of the router. You can see, there we go. We got a beacon, and now it's waiting for an encrypted broadcast uh, packet. Now, this is one small limitation of the attack. Um, uh, as you can see, it was waiting until uh, my laptop connected to this network, because if no one is connected uh, to the network, um, then there is, of course, no traffic. So there must be at least one client, or for some reason, your router has to send uh, one broadcast uh, frame that is encrypted using the uh, broadcast scheme, because otherwise, you know, there is nothing to crack. We don't have any data. So in this case, uh, we captured uh, this frame. So. Let's try to open this capture file. So you can see here we uh, captured a lot of beacon frames. And this beacon frame has a field here, um, which is called the timestamp. And from this, we can determine the uptime. So here you can see it. Here it's very close uh, to uh, zero. Uh, and every time it increases, and from this, we can determine the uptime of the router. There you go. Uh, and at the very end of this capture, we have uh, this broadcast packet, uh, which we want to decrypt. So let's try that. So as I mentioned, uh, this works on the GPU. So first I have to type optirun to enable my GPU while executing the next command. So I simply have a script here. I'm attacking the MediaTek implementation, and I'm using the capture I just made. So now it parses uh, this uh, file here. It lists all the networks that we captured. In this case, uh, because we are in a crowded room, I made sure that I only captured uh, frames from my network uh, to try to make sure that the demo indeed works. And you can see now it's uh, trying to predict uh, the group master key. And it has estimated that the GIFIS values that were used there were around this number. And the GIFIS values that were uh, used for the genome Genons, it has estimated around this value. Now, you may be wondering, why is this Jiffy's value uh, so high? Doesn't it start at zero? Uh, this is actually very interesting, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the Linux kernel starts at a Jiffy's value of minus five minutes. Why do they do that? Well, that's because if you are a developer, uh, and there somehow is a bug in your driver that after five minutes, when your Jiffy values overflows, there is a problem that the developers would very quickly detect issues if your Jiffy's value would overflow. This, this is just to explain why this number is so high, even though we just booted the router. Um, and anyway, you can see that we successfully uh, found uh, the group key here, uh, and it even uh, decrypted the packet uh, for us. So that worked. Uh, and it wrote the single decrypted packet to a file as well. So let's open that as well, so you can uh, see that it indeed works. Here, uh, that's the wrong file. Decrypted. And here you can see uh, the decrypted broadcast packet was uh, an ARP packet. Um, and here you can see the decrypted packet. So we indeed correctly predicted the, the group key, and we were able to decrypt this packet. So let's now try to switch back to the presentation. OK. I will have to go through these slides again, probably. Ah, no. OK, so that was the demo. The demo gods have praised us. Uh, thank God it worked. So. Um, now let's come back to the other vendor, uh, the Broadcom uh, vendor. Um, so as I mentioned, this uh, depends on the operating system that they are using. Uh, in particular, if they are using uh, Linux, uh, then uh, they implement the group key hierarchy as uh, specified in the standard. Um, but they simply read randomness from uh, dev uh, uRandom. So that is much better uh, than uh, the random number generator proposed in the standard. However, a few years ago, there was a paper called Mining Your 
P's and Q's by uh, Henninger et al. And they showed that on specifically on embedded devices and on er older Linux kernels, def u random might be predictable. So this means that on certain devices, uh, def u random is predictable, and in turn, all the group keys might be predictable as well. Um, now, if you run a newer Linux kernel, uh, this should no longer be an issue. However, because a lot of uh, routers use an old kernel, uh, this might be an issue. I haven't tested this. This is simply based uh, on uh, their paper that def u random is not ideal in, for older kernels, essentially. So that's for Linux. Uh, this Broadcom implementation also runs on uh, VxWorks on the ECOS. So for those of you who don't know what these operating systems are, VxWorks on the ECOS, they are both essentially real-time operating systems. Um, VxWorks is uh, proprietary. It's uh, used a lot in aerospace, so it's used in the Mars lander, it's used by SpaceX, uh, it's also used uh, in drones, and of course it's also used on certain routers and access points. Then there's also ECOS, which is essentially similar. It's also a real-time operating system, uh, except it's open source, and it is again used in aerospace, and it's also used uh, by the military in certain situations. Uh, but of course, we focus on when it's used in a router and when it's used as an access point. So we see that in this case, uh, Broadcom again implements uh, the 802.11 group key. Um, and for random numbers, uh, it, has, it simply takes the MD5 hash of the current time in microseconds. Um, so again, that's not uh, ideal at all. There is uh, also another disadvantage of their implementation, and they use this public counter uh, in the handshake, in the four-way handshake that you use when to connect to the network. Now, this is perfectly allowed. There is nothing wrong with that. Um, but it does make it easy for us as attackers because uh, we can uh, collect the value that was used here in the handshake and the one that was used while generating the group key will be only a few numbers away from this value that was leaked. So really the only thing we have to predict here is uh, the group uh, master key. Um, and if we have the group master key, uh, we can then again predict uh, the group key. So. One uh, popular router which is uh, vulnerable to this is the uh, WRT54. Uh, um, at least if you have one that uses version 5 or higher, then it uses a VxWorks kernel. So if you have a router which is version 4 or lower, it runs on Linux. Uh, and of course, if you run DDWRT, uh, DDWRT on this, you're also fine. Uh, but if you have... Uh, version 5 of this device or higher, then you might be vulnerable. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't only had uh, older versions of this uh, router at home, so I simply simulated uh, this attack, again using uh, OpenCL code, uh, and even with just simply quite modest assumptions, um, I predict that you need around 4 to 5 minutes uh, on my GPU to crack it. Uh, and let's say that for some reason my simulation is not perfect, then you can use a more powerful GPU uh, to still predict it. Um, but again, taking the MD5 of the current time in microseconds, it's simply not sufficient uh, to collect uh, enough randomness. So that uh, concludes uh, both uh, these implementations. Then we also have uh, two other examples. The first is uh, called uh, Open Firmware, and the second is uh, Host APD. So open firmware, uh, essentially it's a, simple, it's a simple open source uh, BIOS system. And what was really surprising to me is that uh, during the BIOS, these people uh, have very basic support for Wi-Fi functionality, at least as a client. You can even collect, connect to a WPA2 uh, secured network. Now, for me, that was very surprising to see that a BIOS supports uh, Wi-Fi, um, but they do. Um, now, I do have to say here that they only implement client functionality, so they don't implement uh, access point fun functionality. So they don't actually generate a group key. However, they do use a random number generator to generate other values that are used during the Wi-Fi handshake. Uh, and they use a very, very simple uh, methodology. They simply take the amount of ticks that have uh, occurred since boot. They run that to a linear 
conjugential generator, which is simply a deterministic function uh, and that's used as the random number generator. Uh, yeah, the output of uh, this is uh, hashed to get a sufficiently long output. Uh, but still, this is very easy uh, to predict. And uh, we included this because this is a very good example of uh, an implementation that is running on an embedded system where there is no kernel available uh, to provide you with random numbers. So in this case, we are in the BIOS, there is no kernel, there is no libraries we can use to generate random numbers, and we see that in that situation, very bad solutions uh, are used. And at the, end of a, at the end of the presentation, I will show a way um, where even in these scenarios in embedded system, uh, we can still try to come up with good ways to generate random numbers. So as last example, we have uh, host uh, APD, which is essentially uh, the most used uh, access point uh, on Linux. For example, it is, it is used by Android if you set up uh, a hotspot. Uh, and they have a very good implementation. Uh, they implement the 802.11 group key. Uh, they extended it to include entropy every time a new group key is generated. Uh, so that's very good. Uh, even better than that, they read from uh, def random uh, on boot. And if for some reason there is not enough entropy available, it will simply wait until the first client connects. And then it will try to read again uh, from def random. And if there still isn't enough entropy available, it will simply reject connections. So in other words, uh, if you use host APD, uh, everything should be fine. Um, of course, if the kernel and everything works properly. Um, so that concludes uh, how we can generate and predict uh, this uh, group key. Uh, we will now explain how we can, uh, so this is the second main part of the presentation, how we can exploit this group key to inject on decrypt traffic. So let's start with a simple case. We want to inject a unicast IP packet uh, and we want to send it towards a client. Um, so your initial ID may be okay, you have your IP packet uh, right here. You simply put that into a broadcast uh, Wi-Fi frame, so here we have the Wi-Fi header, of course, very simplified. Basically, we have flags in the header which, which says that this broadcast frame is sent towards a client of our network, and the receiver is the broadcast MAC address. And because the receiver is the broadcast MAC address, this uh, IP packet uh, and everything with it is encrypted and protected using the group key. However, this will uh, not work, and why is that? Well, the client notices that uh, this uh, unicast IP packet is received on a, a grouped addressed uh, Wi-Fi frame. And uh, this is the so-called uh, whole uh, 196 check. Uh, it basically uh, says you should reject packets that are sent on a group addressed uh, link layer, but are sent to a unicast IP address. In other words, this technique will not work. So. How can we try to bypass this technique? Well, the realization we have to make is that this check occurs when a link layer packet is being passed on to the network layer where we have these unicast IP addresses. And an access point only works at the link layer. So if we can somehow abuse the access point, then we might be able to bypass this check. So let me simply explain the technique uh, that we're going to use. So we have our net network here with the victim, uh, with the attacker, which wants to send uh, a packet to the client. Um, but what the attacker will do, it will first uh, send this IP packet towards the access point. So again, we have our IP packet here. Uh, now we add a bit more complicated Wi-Fi header, which says uh, this group frame, this broadcast frame, is sent to the access point. The immediate receiver uh, is, in this case, the broadcast MAC address. However, the final destination of the frame is the victim. So what will happen if the access point receives uh, this frame? Well, it will notice, okay, the frame is indeed destined for me. I will use the group key to decrypt it because I did receive it on the broadcast MAC address. Everything is fine. And then it will notice, while it's still operating at the link layer, oh, but the final destination is actually the victim. So I have to forward this packet to the victim. And the access point, of course, has the session keys, the pairwise keys of the client. So it will simply take this IP packet, it will encrypt it using the session keys for us, 
and then it will simply send it to the victim for us. Uh, and now when the victim receives this packet, uh, everything seems okay. We have our unicast receiver addresses, a unicast IP address, it is properly encrypted, so everything is okay and the attack works. The second part is that we want to also uh, decrypt packets. And the idea behind this is uh, very simple. It's also very simple to explain. We simply are poison uh, the router on the client so that the IP address of the gateway and the IP address of the client are the broadcast MAC address. Uh, and then um, both the router and the client uh, will send unicast IP traffic through a broadcast MAC address and it will encrypt it using the group, free group key, which we have so we can decrypt this packet uh, and then forward them to assure that connectivity uh, stays and that the client doesn't notice anything. So that's actually quite simple. Um, how we can we prevent this? Well, the first thing is that if the access point receives a broadcast frame, um, but with a unicast final destination, it should not forward these. Um, and an even better countermeasure is that uh, in an infrastructure network, so uh, not necessarily in a mesh network, but in an infrastructure network where you have an access point, um, the access point should simply uh, ignore frames that are received on a broadcast MAC address. Uh, and then these issues uh, would be avoided. So I would say that that was the most uh, fun part of the research. Um, we're now going to look at a theoretical attack against the uh, handshake uh, that is uh, being used, where we can force uh, usage of uh, RC4. Um, so, okay, let's first quickly explain how the uh, handshake works. So we have our client here, which sometimes is also called the supplicant during the handshake, and we have our access point. So the beginning is very simple. Your access point is constantly transmitting uh, beacons. Uh, those beacons contain uh, the, uh, the features of the access point. For example, whether it supports uh, 802.11 or whether it supports AC. And it also uh, includes the supported ciphers of the network. In practice, this basically means whether it supports uh, WPA TKIP or AES uh, CCMP. Then the client will select uh, either TKIP or AES, uh, and it will send an association request to the network. Uh, and this packet here uh, basically tells the network, I want to join, uh, and this is the cipher I want to use. In reply to that, uh, the access point generates, generates a random nonce. The client will also generate a random nonce. So uh, these random nonces are used to prevent replay attacks, and they are used to assure that fresh uh, session keys are negotiated. So here we have the access point nonce, so the A nonce, and we have the supplicant nonce, uh, also the client nonce. So it's the same as the client nonce, which is the S nonce. Once they both uh, have received these S nonces, they can receive, uh, they can derive the session keys. Um, and after this first stage of the handshake, we are essentially going to confirm that everything uh, was okay, that there was no attacker, and we, the access point is going to send the group key, uh, the group temporal key, in message three of the handshake. And in message three, it also includes an authenticated cipher list of the ciphers that the access point supports. So this is to prevent downgrade attacks. Let's say that we have a man-in-the-middle attacker, which here says, okay, I only support the old uh, TKIP uh, cipher. Um, then the client would connect using TKIP. However, at that, this stage, uh, the real access point, which uh, sent message three, which includes the real cipher list, which is authenticated uh, using the password of the network, essentially, meaning an attacker cannot uh, modify this packet, and the client would notice after receiving message three if there was a possible downgrade attack because uh, this authenticated cipher list uh, might not match the ones that was received in unprotected beacons. So the problem with this design is that the group key here is transmitted and encrypted uh, before the client can prevent and detect downgrade attacks. So what can an attacker do here? An attacker can uh, put up a rogue access point it can modify the beacon messages and say, hey, I only include, I only support WPA TKIP, which means that the client will connect using WPA TKIP. And in case that the session cipher is WPA TKIP, then this group key here, when it is transmitted to the client, is encrypted and protected using RC4. 
If uh, AES would have been used, then we also would use AES to protect the group key and everything would be fine. However, in this case, uh, we are using uh, RC4 if we, can, uh, if we are performing this attack. And RC4 is, of course, uh, quite uh, bad. Um, so for the crypto people around here, um, I'm very quickly going to explain how RC4 is used. You basically have a 16-byte initialization vector, which is public. You have a 16-byte secret key. On the first 250 key stream bytes are dropped. Um, this is actually a very strange construction if you're a bit used to RC4. Um, I'm simply going to intuitively explain the problem with RC4 in this case, and also the problem with RC4 in general. Here you see a graph um, which kind of illustrates the behavior of RC4 in this case. So normally, if you would make these kinds of graphs for a secure cipher, for example, for AES, this would be completely white. Um, so what does this graph illustrate? Well, say for example, here you are at keystream position, uh, say 300. If we then go look at uh, keystream value, let's say around 90, we can see that there's a blue dot here. What does that, that mean? Uh, that means uh, that the keystream byte at position 300 is uh, slightly less likely than uniform to contain the value 90. Uh, normally, this should be uniformly random. Normally, if you have a proper uh, cipher, uh, every keystream byte should occur uh, as often as all the others. However, you can see here in the colors that these blue keystream bytes at certain values occur less often, and these red ones occur more often uh, than others. Uh, and this graph depends on the specific analyzation vector that is being used. So the only thing I would uh, take away from this slide is that uh, if you use RC4, some keystream values occur more often than others, and we can abuse that in an attack. So. If we were to perform similar attacks against the ones uh, that were uh, executed against uh, SSL and HTTPS in a few recent years, um, then we can see it's still a theoretical attack because it would take around 50 years to execute. And the reason is because uh, we need to collect a lot of encrypted traffic to perform our cryptanalysis. And in the case of Wi-Fi, this is very time consuming to do. Um, however, attacks only get better, uh, in fact, a few weeks ago, I found a trick to execute these handshakes more frequently, meaning uh, this time would be, I think, at least divided by two or three. Uh, so let's say that someone would put more time in this. We could probably uh, lower this value more and more every year. Um, so the takeaway message is, uh, from a cryptographic standpoint, RC4 is broken, and you should simply not uh, use it anymore. Um, so the countermeasure is, if you have a network at home, simply disable WPA2 TKIP. So if you have a network, not only should you select that it uh, has to use uh, WPA2, you have to explicitly configure it to only use AES. Uh, and in that case, you are safe against uh, this specific attack. So finally, the last part of the presentation is just uh, a very short short suggestion on uh, how we can we improve uh, the random number generator. And we want to make sure that the improvement that we suggest even works on embedded systems where there is no kernel available uh, and where there is uh, very little chance of collecting randomness. Well, our observation is essentially, well, okay, we have a Wi-Fi chip, and this Wi-Fi chip uh, can monitor all the Wi-Fi signals around. So why not simply extract randomness from all the Wi-Fi frames uh, that we receive? In other words, why not collect randomness from, from background noise? And we actually found uh, one device, uh, it is this one. This has a so-called spectral scan feature, and this means that this uh, chip is able to collect a lot of samples uh, of the current uh, Wi-Fi background noise, even if there is no traffic or nothing is going on. And we can generate a very large amount uh, of samples every second. Uh, the current downside is that uh, this is a bit energy... Uh, this, this takes a lot of energy, uh, so you can't uh, run this very long. 
Um, but we did implement uh, this idea to extract uh, randomness uh, from uh, the background nose uh, of the Wi-Fi channel. Uh, and we uh, did a few statistical tests on this, uh, and our results were promising. Uh, it shows that we can indeed extract randomness from background noise. Now, this is just a proposal. Uh, some more research here is needed, but I think that uh, Wi-Fi vendors uh, should provide a feature that uh, common Wi-Fi chips uh, export some of this randomness, which can then directly be used, or it can be used by the kernel uh, to strengthen the current uh, pool of randomness. Um, so that concludes uh, my talk. There are a few important lessons uh, to take away here. The first is, if you have a random number generator, always check the quality of the output. Uh, and especially if you put this in the standard, don't put uh, very bad example algorithms, uh, which are really bad. If you design a specification, what you put in there should be good and it should work. Uh, otherwise, just reference an external source where it is explained uh, better. Um, and to protect, uh, to defend against the attack where we decrypt all traffic of a network, uh, like I mentioned, the access point uh, should ignore any frames uh, that are received on a broadcast MAC address, uh, or it which should simply not uh, forward unicast uh, frames that are sent on a broadcast MAC address. Finally, um, regarding the protocol that is used in the handshake, you should try to avoid sending sensitive data before trying to protect uh, downgrade uh, attacks. So that concludes my presentations. If there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you, Mati. We have uh, a few minutes left for questions, so if you have any questions, please line up uh, next to the microphones um, and ask your questions. Make good use of our time. If the, we have any questions from the internet, yes, please. Uh, yes, two questions from the internet. The first one, uh, would you consider um, WPA2 with a pre-shared queue um, still safe? Um. If the pre-shared key is uh, good and unpredictable, um, then these type of dictionary attacks, they are no longer possible. Uh, however, you still have the issue of the group key. And uh, in fact, this group key, which is badly generated, this applies to uh, both enterprise networks and uh, networks that use a pre-shared key. Um, currently, I believe that uh, the handshake that is used in Wi-Fi can be improved. So. If you use a pre-shared key, I don't consider it as strong uh, as an enterprise network where you have proper credentials. So I would say that an enterprise network is more secure in most cases. However, as a general user, if you have a complex uh, pre-shared key, then you're still good. Okay, question from here. Um, for the ARP spoofing, did you consider a gratuitous ARP offer on the networks? Because you already have access to the broadcast, so. Um, well, I think that's what we use to poison uh, the entries of the client. Okay. So we send a broadcast uh, our packet uh, to poison uh, the client on the router. If that explains your question. Uh, yeah, but you can you can exploit other clients in the network. You just send a gratuitous ARP. So uh, you basically broadcast the ARP entry to anybody on the network, just not. One single client with the unicast. Well, you, you can send it to any client you want. Uh, you can say, I want to inject traffic of this client, or you can maybe try to send it to all clients. Um, I haven't looked at that much in detail. Uh, I just tested if you want to attack one client, uh, that works. If you want to attack okay. another client, you can just do the same attack. OK, thanks. Yes. Um, have you, for, uh, regarding your uh, problem, uh, where the access point sends the um, broadcast packet uh, further as a unicast packet. Mm -hmm. uh, does it, is it uh, demanded in the standard to do it this way, or um, have you checked uh, if all implementations do it this way, or uh, only some? That's uh, a good question. I don't know exactly what the standard says. Uh, what I do know is that uh, not even all implementations implement this uh, whole 196 attack. So there you can even directly send frames to the client without needing to abuse the access point. 
so I don't think that this idea of forwarding packets is explicitly mentioned in the standard. I think they just haven't thought about that. Uh, but I would guess that most implementations would be vulnerable to this forwarding trick through the access point. I, mean, I, I would be surprised if certain vendors thought about protecting against that. It could be, but I think the chance is low. Okay, uh, last talk, uh, uh, last question, sorry. No, no. <laughs> okay, then uh, I think we're done. Again, big round of applause for a great talk from Matthew.